I think we're ready to go. We're going to be starting, and I think finishing, believe it or not. Oh, so people will need a Psalm 64 probably for next week or the week after. So we're going to be starting on point 10 uh, with this psalm. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and we'll get going on it. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for loving us. Father, I ask that you would help us tonight as we look into your word. Help it to be clear. Help us to be able to, to apply it. I pray that you would in some way be glorified by our time here this evening. Lord, ask for your help as we as I preach that you would give me the words that are needed. Help them be accurate in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Psalm 63. Let's go ahead and start with the entire Psalm, the entire, all 11 verses. We're going to start reading at verse 1 and go down, and then we'll jump into this text. We'll start with verse 9 for our text tonight. The Psalm 63, starting with verse 1. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as of marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul follows hard after thee. My, thy right hand upholds me. Let's stop just a second. Are you noticing anything particular in the, the tone of everything that David has been saying in verses one through eight? How would you describe his tone? Hear, hear all these things from you. Yes. You. Okay. God, he, he's magnifying God. How much complaining do you see? I mean, exceptionally little. There, there's nothing here. David is hopeful. David is saying, you know, God is so good to me, and he's just praising God through this psalm. And just as a quick reminder, uh, the, the picture we were just looking at, that barren wasteland, that's the kind of area that David was in. He is in a wasteland where he should be dying, and everything he's saying is very, very positive. And today, no, notice the first word of verse 9. What is it? But we're going to change gears. Everything has been God is great. God is providing. I trust God, but... Now we have a little bit of a different scenario. Now we're going to see the problem for the rejectors. This is where we see the negative side <laughs> of, of our text, if you will. So verse 9. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go to the low into the lower parts of the earth. So this the, the but this is taking that satisfaction, that trust in God. God is the one who helps. God is the one who upholds. But it's not that way for those who reject him. It, God does not help and uphold those who are seeking to kill David. That's the point that David's pushing here. So here they are, these people. They are striving with all their might. They are trying to destroy, and let's just use these words, God's anointed. They want to ruin God's anointed. The one who has this relationship with the Lord is the one they're wanting to destroy. Now, I, I'm I do not believe we're gonna we're pushing this application too far. When I say when I use this this example, David is making a statement. That God takes it very seriously when someone goes after his children. God does not take that lightly. Is there a New Testament passage that you can think of where this is stated that you're in a bad condition when you try to hurt God's children? New Testament? Yes. 
Can you think of a New Testament passage? You are not putting yourself in a good position with God when you offend his children. You're better to have a millstone tied around your neck than to offend one of his little ones. The little That's Matthew 18. So the little ones, that's not just talking about children. That's God's little ones, God's children, God's possession, if you will. When people start offending and causing to stumble God's children, they're putting themselves in a very bad position with God. Same passage. You're better to have a millstone tied around your neck. Matthew 18. Matthew 18 is known for something than a little bit more popular, I would say, than that verse. What else is in Matthew 18 that we use that is like the go-to passage? Yes, church discipline. That is where when someone is in sin, God takes this extremely seriously. It matters to him that God's children not be sinned against. So those, this idea of sinning against, how can you and I today, we're talking about sinning against someone, causing them to you know, luring them away, causing them to fall, throwing doubts. These people are going to answer to God. Vengeance is going to be his. But how can you and I be guilty of this today? Can we lure someone and be responsible for causing them to sin? And I'm saying responsible in the sense of leading them. I, you cannot force me to sin. I choose to. There is always a way to escape. I understand that, but I can be guilty of leading you into sin. How can we do that today? Well, um, Paul talks about um, causing a brother uh, to stumble by your liberty. So something that you can do in faith is not something that's contrary to God, but brother who their faith, uh, you know, it would not be a faith for them to do whatever you're partaking in. Um, for you to insist on doing uh, said things in their presence or encouraging them to participate um, would be causing, would be leading them. Okay. What are some examples of that? One example. And then I ask for another example. Because this matters. I guess one example would be like in the form of like eating or drinking. Okay, that one's pretty straight from the Bible. But uh, there are some people who have very high dietary restrictions or dietary um, convictions, put it that way. Um, I, I, <laughs> I don't know this is so much the same thing, but I've known a number of SDA people, uh, so they've been as, you know, they're very concerned about even what you eat, right? Dietary levels. That's a little different, though, because I'm not sure that they really are. Right. We're really just in Christ. It's hard. It's a hard, it's a hard one. But um, I don't know. That would be. Okay. What else? Yes. It has to do with moderation. You know, this is let your moderation be known. Well, that word for moderation, what, what um, let your moderation, and I'm, I'm just, for, that one's not talking about a, um, how much of something. Um, but it, but your points, your points taken. Yes, we do things in moderation, and I'll use this word, and this comes up often. Um, it is, and let's just pick on one that Americans struggle with: uh, eating. Is it a sin to be overeating? I'm using that word very cautiously. Is it a sin to overeat? I'm, I'm getting a lot of blank stares right now. Oh, no, we're touching it. We're touching it. Is it a sin to overeat? Why? Huh? Yes, it's gluttony. It's exactly, and I used overeat intentionally. It's a sin to practice gluttony. 
Well, that's an American, and I'm saying this nice, it's an American acceptable sin. Just like gossip is an American acceptable sin. It's sin. So that's exactly why I don't like going to buffets, because I struggle with that. That's a hard part for me. So what do we do? Am I helping someone to not sin when we have a pitch and dinner and I know they struggle? And I say, no, come on, one more plate of dessert not going to hurt you. Come on. I, I better be careful with that. I could, well, and I'm talking about the help. I'm talking about sin. But the sin is what we're concerned about right now. And a lot of the diabetes is going to go away as people stop being gluttonous. So that's the problem we have. I am, and so that's just like a side effect, the health side. I'm talking about the spiritual aspect. I can lead someone and encourage them to sin. Just by saying, go get more food. We can do the same thing. And, you know, we're not going to get into this debate tonight. Um, alcohol is a huge debate. Okay. And just for the record, I'm a teetotaler. I don't want any of it, but I'm going to tell you something. My reasoning may be different than others, but if I am okay, I'm not, if I am okay with drinking and I'll, I'll pick on Pete, if he isn't sure and I come across with this, you know, look, it's okay. Don't worry about it. This, and I give him my arguments for why it's okay. If he goes against his conscience and acts not in faith, he has sinned and I have a part in that. We can lead people into sin. No different. I'm thinking of an example right now that I can't mention details, but, um, I know of one where a relative pulled aside children of their relative and said, no, 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 forget what they said. It's okay. They sinned against that. Those children, they sinned against the parents. They sinned. Okay, we, this, is, this can happen today. We got to be really careful with this. This is one reason, I mean, Back on the alcohol thing, and I look at people who are struggling in our body. In this little church, there are people who struggle significantly. And to have someone come alongside someone who's struggling and say, look, just, and let's pick on that word, just use moderation. There are some people, you know, don't you use moderation? Don't you touch it because you can't handle it? Hence why I say I would be a teetotaler. I don't want to be throwing, and especially, and it's not just that I'm in a position, but I've got, I, if someone looks at me and I'm doing something, that puts a lot of weight behind it. And I don't want to put that weight behind it. So we've got to be careful because... We can be guilty, and going back to that verse, if we cause one of God's little ones to stumble, we will not suffer judgment, so to speak. Jesus said it's better a millstone hung around his neck. Now, for the death, he's going to have to be looking at unsaved, but we will answer. We will give an account for the things done in our body. So we need to be extremely cautious and that's when this passage goes on to talk to believers about how you handle people who have offended and how we have that responsibility to go to people and if they won't respond we take more and we go again and if they don't respond the whole entire church gets together and goes and we we've got to deal with sin extremely seriously because it's a serious matter to god those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go to the lower parts of the earth. So this is a serious matter. We've got to be careful that the things that we allow are totally above reproach. And there's other things that we could go into. Um, there are, there's many things we could go into. And I, I'm going to stop there for tonight. 
But let me just throw this caution out. When in doubt, don't. If there's anything questionable, you better back up hard. You better start. You, you, you better get on your knees before God and make sure you are not helping to lead someone else astray. We've got to take our spiritual life that seriously because we can have an impact on other people. So what does it look like when this happens to us? So look at verse nine again. Those who seek my soul to destroy it. They seek my soul. They're seeking my life. They're seeking my honor. This is what David's saying. They're seeking his welfare. They're seeking his spiritual closeness that he has with God to destroy him. Who is the destroyer? Satan is the destroyer. John 10, 10, he is a destroyer. He wants to steal. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. We know from John 8, he was a murderer from the beginning. He was a liar from the beginning. The devil's followers use the same tactics. They want to kill and steal and to destroy and lie. That is what they do. But take comfort. Someone turn for me. Uh, Proverbs 26, 27. Whoever gets it, go ahead and just read. Proverbs 26, verse 27. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and a stone will come back on him who starts it rolling. So let's use this words as far as uh the, the 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 devil he is a destroyer the destroyers will be destroyed it will happen they are going to be destroyed we though are to return good for evil we are to love our enemies but david here he gives us the destroyer's fate he's going to tell us this is where they're heading those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. A couple of different interpretations for this. What would one of the obvious ones be? Lower parts of the earth. Death. Okay, death. They will die. They will go to a grave. Okay, that's one interpretation. What would another interpretation be? Or hell. Hell. I would lean towards that one. Everyone's going to die. Now with David, he could be saying here, and, and rightfully so, those who are after me, as I'm pointing to the map that's not there, as I'm going through this desert place, they're going to die. But when they die, they're also going to the lower parts. They are going to be punished. They will be in hell as they are seeking to harm God's people. They're trying to ruin God's followers. That, that's not the mark of a believer. That's not what believers do. And their end result is hell. And let me just throw this out for us in today's culture and in our church today. It is not the mark of a believer for someone to try to see another believer fall. To try to lead them astray into a, a path that at best, I don't think anyone in this room, anyone in this church, I don't think anyone would say, you know, I want to see Rick go into this sin. I don't think they're going to do that, but they would say something like this. This isn't a big deal. Well, if those words come out of your mouth or get into your mind, if it's just not a big deal, can I just say this bluntly? Keep your mouth shut. Don't be leading someone into something that's not a big deal. Let's lead each other into godliness. Let's edify each other. Let's help each other grow, not get into stuff that's questionable at, at, at best. So they'll go to the lower parts of the earth. And I'm gonna, I would just say here, I would say the primary. Yes, they're going to die. Yes, they will be punished. But the end result will be hell. So number 10, or verse 10, they shall fall by the sword. They'll fall by the sword. Now, again, immediate context. David is getting chased by people trying to kill him. He is confident that he's going to get delivered from his foes. He's very confident. But we have to be careful with passages like this. People today will try to interpret these passages to apply to us 
Now, if someone is trying to harm me, God is going to make them fall. Is that true? And I'm talking the immediate context. Is God always going to protect us from trouble? No. no. He will not always protect us. It's appointed unto men to die. Okay, we're going to, we've got a meeting one day. And there are people who constantly have been killed, martyred, while standing for the faith. It's not, he's, he's not saying here, every Christian, their enemies will always fall. The enemies will never succeed. The enemies have succeeded. For centuries, they succeeded. But David, here's the difference. David had a promise. David had promises from God, you are going to stay on this throne. David understood from God that he was in this line of Messiah. He had promises, and what David is doing here is healthy. He is claiming promises of God. You and I don't have promises that we will succeed in everything we do. We don't have promises that anyone who attacks us is going to lose. We don't have those promises. David did. Where we do have promises, we need to claim them. As God promised, I'll never leave you or, nor forsake you. Yes, he has. Has he promised that he will always give us a way out when we are tempted to sin so we don't have to? Yes, I can claim those promises. So as we have promises, we claim them. And that's what David is doing in the text today. So David is committed, and we've seen this in verses one through eight. He is committed to rejoicing in God. His relationship is strong. No matter what comes his way, he's saying it is worth it to have this allegiance to God. And again, that's for us today. It is worth it. I mean, think about it. What's the alternative? I'm going to turn on the God who saved me and go serve myself. There, there is no alternative. God's ways are good. Even when we go through trials, God's ways are good. He knows what he's doing. He's worthy to be trusted. His way is best. And it's, you've heard this before. It's not just so much us saying, well, it could have been worse. Well, duh. I mean, it can always be worse. But it's God's ways are good. Does that mean that we really enjoy when the things are tough? Well, no, but we trust him in it because his ways are good. He's working in us. He's changing us. Now, he also says here, um, they'll fall by the sword. They'll fall by the sword. He's confident. That, they're, that, that his enemies are going to um, are going to fall. And then he says, uh, end of verse 10, they shall be a portion for foxes. Did you notice on the song it doesn't say that? What word did it use? Jackals. jackals. That's the Hebrew. The, 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 the word, Hebrew word for that comes from the word for jackals. Either way, it's the same thing. He's saying... Wild animals are going to prevent you having a decent burial. They're going to eat you. And if you escape wounded from this conflict, wild animals are going to eat you. This is not a good, uh, a good ending. I can think of a lot of ways that I would not want to end up, and that's one of them. These wild animals are going to finish them off. So here's David's point. They are wrong to mess with God's children. We need to remember this. We are wrong to mess with God's children and God will exercise vengeance. I don't know what all that's going to look like. I don't know how God's going to work his, his vengeance. You know, God doesn't like it when we mess with his children and we lose, we lose a measure at least of fellowship with our God when we start doing that and messing with his children. Your application statement, let's make sure 
we're actively building up others instead of intentionally or inadvertently harming them in any way. I tried to make those words specific. We can inadvertently, and I'll say this loosely, by accident, if you want, just by being careless, we can lead people astray. We must actively seek to build up and to edify people. That's got to be happening. Our last point, purposefully following God. Okay, notice again, he's got that same word. There we go. He's got that same word. He started verse nine, but, okay, we change gears. Now verse 11, but we're changing gears again. He switches back from the rejectors to him following the Lord. So he's getting back to the, to the positive, if you will. Now, this is another one of these. We can interpret it a few different ways, and we're going to hit them all. Some of them um, are with the immediate context, and some look for a future, and it can apply to both. But let's look at these. Verse 11, but the king shall rejoice in God. Now, what would the primary immediate application be with that? Who's the king? David, David, he's saying the king shall rejoice in God. I am going to rejoice in God. That relationship is strong, regardless of what comes my way. I am going to, it's, it's going to be worth it to stay true to God, to have this allegiance with God. And again, that same thing is true today. It is worth it. To stay true to God is worth it. And David's making this statement. Now, Another meaning, of, another way to look at this would be this emphasizing this word different. But the king shall rejoice in God. The real king, see, Absalom thought it was him. David saying, no, it's not you, it's me. The real king, the one that God has his hand on, that one's going to be rejoicing in God when this is all over with. I'm going to be rejoicing because I'm... I'm the real deal. I'm the one that God has said, you're in charge. You're the king. I have God's blessing. Therefore, God has made this promise. And the real king, the one that God chooses, because he's in control, is the one that's going to be rejoicing. Now, one other way we could see this is to look at the ultimate king. Jesus is totally going to be rejoicing in his relationship with God, and Jesus did. Jesus made David's suffering look light. Jesus' suffering was the worst that anybody has ever seen. Jesus' attacks from the enemies were worse than anyone has ever seen, and they saw, and they eventually, with God's permission or allowance, they killed him. He allowed himself to be destroyed by these wicked men. But Jesus rejoiced in the work that he and his father were finishing. He rejoiced and he delighted. It, it pleased the father to bruise him. That passage is so hard to read sometimes. It pleased the father to have his son go through that because of us. There was a rejoicing and a satisfaction that the ultimate king, the Messiah, had in what he did for us. And all through it, Jesus' relationship with the Father, it never wavered. Isn't that our example? Isn't that what we're to follow? No matter what comes our way, no matter how hard the temptations and the testings are, we're to be true to our Lord, just like our Messiah was. And that's what David, David said. He wants to rejoice in God. Regardless of how hard it was at that point in time, he wants to rejoice in God. Second part of that verse, everyone that swears by him shall glory. Okay, let's take the same scenarios, primary, immediate context, David. Everybody that stays true to David, they're going to be with him. They're going to have the glory. They're going to be... Uh, happy when this victory comes about and all those who lied about him they get exposed those who follow David are going to 
be glorying. They're going to be satisfied. Now, if we take it just as this, which I'm not arguing that point right now, if we take it that those who stick by those who are doing right, how would that come? How do we see some of this happening today? What are you and I commanded to do in the church? Some of this we saw this morning. Are we to love the brethren? Are we to stay true to the brethren? You know, Paul spoke of the being a loyal companion. Philippians 4, 3, we're to do good to all men. What's the rest of that verse? Especially those of the household of God. We are to stand by those whom belong to God. So we should be following this that same example. If they were to stay by David, they're going to glory. Because that David was God's chosen one. We need to stand by God's people as well. But we could also see this as referring back to God. Everyone that swears by him. The king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that swears by him shall glory. Everyone that swears by God shall glory. We can have this confidence that as we are faithful and give our allegiance to God, we'll share in his glory. We will share in the growth, we'll share in that relationship, but those who reject following him, those who speak lies shall be stopped. As we stand with our Lord, as we honor our Lord, we will be on the, the glorying side, the victorious side. As we stand against him, we will be on the defeated side. And, there, and that will be stopped. So David is saying, you've got a choice here. Are you going to follow God and stand with his people and support his people? Or are you going to follow the devil and your flesh and stand with those who are opposed to God? You, we look at that and we think, this is a no-brainer. Of course, we're going to stand with God. And it, and his people. But what happens within the church? Do we not have this constant battle where we have to keep reminding ourselves, I've got to, I'm supposed to love the brethren. I'm, supp I'm supposed to love my enemies. I'm, I'm not supposed to be leading them astray. I'm supposed to be walking with Jesus. This is a constant fight. And we need to be, in this case, standing with those who stand with the Lord. Your application statement was be sure we're on the side of actively following Jesus, which will lead us to rejoicing in him. Comments. Especially those last two verses. Go ahead. Okay, those who bless. This one would be David specifically, but your point with Israel is true. Those who bless Israel, God's going to bless. Those who curse Israel, God's going to curse. And we do that because that's God's chosen people. And God has said those words. As a nation, as a nation, they are, they are the only chosen nation. So as people say, America is God's chosen, America is not God's chosen nation. I'm God's chosen person. Ephesians makes it real clear. He chose me. How did that work? I don't know. But he did it. But he never chose our nation. He only chose the Jewish nation. So in that sense, yes, they are more chosen than the only chosen You lost me on that one, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, Palestinians like Palestinians. Yeah, same battle. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's the same same Philistines versus. Okay, okay, I get it. <laughs> so here we see anything else as far as us purposefully following God. Any other comments on these two verses? Okay. This psalm has been enjoyable for me. I've I've appreciated a lot of the truths in it. I hope it's been good for you. Um, in two weeks, next week's the fifth Sunday. Uh, we won't have an evening service, but in two weeks we'll be kicking off verse or chapter Psalm 64. So looking forward to that one as well. All right. Well, let's close in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you again for your goodness. Lord, help us to be passionate about you. Help us to have a desire to follow you above all else. Lord, where there are things and people in our lives that are tempting us to pull away from you, to, to soften our walk with you. Lord, help us to resist that and to be, to be loving you as we should. Lord, I ask for your help as we leave tonight. Lord, just give us protection this week. Help us to be, as, as Paul asked, Lord, to be wise in using your word, to be bold in using your word. Lord, give us a, a desire to follow you and to live for you. We pray you would allow us to see you working through us and in us. In Jesus' name, amen.